In this lesson, we'll pick up with the question of how do cells get energy, and then move on to why are cells so small. We have to issue a caution here. Life is complex, and so in this lesson especially, we want to just get the main idea of what these cells are doing. We've learned that food molecules like glucose contain potential energy stored in their chemical bonds. It took energy to make those bonds, and when those bonds are released, energy is released. In our picture of the bacteria, we're at the stage where food has entered the, entered the cell across the cell membrane with the help of proteins, and a team of proteins have begun to break the chemical bonds of glucose. Now, they don't completely destroy glucose. They break it down into what we're going to call high-energy molecules. The next stage of energy processing occurs over here in the green circle here. It involves the high-energy molecules providing the energy to power these protein pumps. These pumps are going to pump charged particles protons, those are hydrogen ions, across the membrane. When they collect outside the cell, that is sort of like a reservoir of potential energy. And those protons are going to rush down through this protein in the membrane. And the energy released from that inflow of protons is going to be, be used to power the chemistry of making ATP. Now, ATP it, uh, is an energy molecule. It's the energy currency of cells on Earth. And they uh, hold just the right amount of energy to do lots of the chemistry in the cell. You'll remember from an earlier lesson we said glucose was an energy molecule. When you break the bonds of glucose, energy is released. But glucose has a relatively large amount of energy stored in all those chemical bonds. The chemistry in the cell requires smaller quantities of energy. So what the cell does is it takes the energy of glucose and it packages smaller quantities of energy into the chemical bonds of this molecule called ATP. So if we think of glucose as a $20 bill, it's $20 worth of energy. ATP molecules have a dollar's worth of energy. Now let's go back to this all-important process up here in the cell membrane. It's another team of proteins, and they are pumps, and they have to be powered by the energy in food molecules. And they're going to be pumping protons. These are hydrogen ions. Let's see what a hydrogen ion is. You'll recall a hydrogen atom has one proton and one electron. The proton being positively charged, the electron negatively charged, this is a neutral atom. Well, if the electron is stripped from the nucleus, we're left with a negatively charged electron and a proton, which is positively charged. That's a hydrogen ion. It's a charged particle, in this case a proton. So what we see in this picture then is these little dots up here would be hydrogen ions. And these pumps are hydrogen ion pumps, and they're powered by the energy from these food molecules. And they're going to create this collection of hydrogen ions, and that is a form of potential energy. Because we've got a lot of them outside the cell membrane, relatively fewer of them inside, and if they have a way to get into the cell, they will move down their concentration gradient into the cell. That's a release of energy. And we saw something like this when we talked about the dam. The idea is that you, you block up this water, you raise the water level to a height so that now when the water falls, the potential energy of the water gets converted into kinetic energy and that can run a turbine and make electricity. So in a sense, what we have here is the cell is creating, it's damming up a bunch of hydrogen ions and then allowing those hydrogen ions to flow back into the cell. And that release of energy is going to be coupled to the production of a useful energy molecule called ATP. This process of the cell pumping the hydrogen ions across a membrane and then letting them flow back in, this process is called the electron transport chain. And it, it is a really important discovery about living cells because most cells on Earth use this process to create useful energy molecules, ATP. And so that suggests that, that the first living things have uh, hit upon this kind of a strategy to process energy, and they passed on that uh, mechanism to all subsequent life forms. Now we're ready then to tackle why are bacteria microscopic? Well, notice the energy production of a cell utilizes proteins on the membrane of the cell. And so the surface area of the cell, which would have these proteins, is going to be a limiting factor in how much energy can be produced by the cell. 
So you see, you can only pack a certain number of these proteins in the cell membrane. Now here we just have the, the three of them here, but in reality they would be studded throughout the, the membrane here, in addition to other kinds of proteins as well. So we have a limitation then the surface area of the membrane here is going to be a limit to how many of these proteins can be in inserted there and therefore how much energy can be produced by the cell. Now, while the production of energy is related to the surface area of the cell, the energy needs of a cell are related to the volume of the cell. In the cytoplasm, energy is used to build the cell's molecular parts. Thus, a larger volume of cytoplasm requires more energy to carry out the chemistry of life. As we see in this picture here, we're going to be uh, kind of simulating what happens as the cell grows larger. Well, the production of energy will be growing larger, and so the word production is getting bigger as the cell gets bigger. But now we have the key point. As a bacteria cell grows larger, its surface area also grows larger, but its volume grows faster than its surface area. Thus, cell growth creates an energy shortage. So in the picture, while the word production is getting bigger as the surface area of the cell gets bigger, the word need here, which relates to the energy need of the cell, and that's related to the volume, the word need is getting bigger faster. And so notice then the production here may not be able to meet the needs of the cell. Cells must remain small. So cells are microscopic because of the way they produce energy. And let me qualify that a little bit. Bacteria are microscopic because of the way bacteria produce energy in this fashion. But we'll see the story is a little bit different for more complicated cells like animal cells. But animal cells also face the surface area problem because they import food across their membrane. So here's an animal cell and we've got food entering. And again, it's proteins that have to transport the food in. So the surface area of the cell is going to limit the number of these proteins that, that can exist in the membrane and so limit the amount of food that can be imported into the cell. Larger cells cannot import enough food to meet the energy needs of the chemistry in the cytoplasm. So how do animals get around this? How can animals be big if their cells have to be small and of course, the answer is multicellularity. So organisms can achieve larger size by being multicellular. Each cell is small enough to meet its energy needs, but the cooperation of many cells allows an organism to reap the benefits of larger size. So here again, we now have the cell represented as a cube, and we've got proteins on the surface that are importing food molecules. Uh, a single cell can't get that big because it won't have enough proteins to be able to import enough food to meet the needs uh, in the cytoplasm of the cell. But if you just pack a bunch of smaller cells together, you can create the same size organism, right? And, and even larger organisms because each cell has enough of these proteins on its membrane to get enough food to meet its needs. But together, they make a larger organism. In this final summary diagram, we'll get into a little more detail. Again, we use caution here, we just want the big idea. We have food molecule like glucose being broken down by a team of proteins initially, and some of the carbon atoms in glucose will be released as waste carbon dioxide, so that's some of the waste from glucose metabolism. High energy molecules are going to be powering these protein pumps. The pumps are pumping hydrogen ions across the membrane. And the energy provided by these high energy molecules comes in the form of high energy electrons. And there's a kind of a transfer of these high energy electrons, uh, sort of like a hot potato. It loses energy as it's passed along. Ultimately, those electrons are accepted by oxygen, forming water molecules. There are hydrogen ions in solution that hook up with the oxygen and the electrons to make water. So it is important to note that this energy processing requires oxygen and the other waste product is water. So the waste of breaking down glucose is carbon dioxide and water and this chemistry requires oxygen for it to happen. Meanwhile, the hydrogen ions are collecting out here and that's potential energy just like water in a dam. This protein in the membrane, very important protein called ATP synthase, it will allow these hydrogen ions to rush back into the cell 
and in a sense the potential energy is being converted into kinetic energy that completes this chemistry where ATP is produced so these uh, energy molecules are charged with energy those ATP molecules will uh, go out into the cytoplasm and, and participate in the chemistry of life and they will use up their energy turning into ADP molecules which then get recharged again in this cycle so food molecules power the pumps the proton gradient is used to make ATP ATP is used up in the chemistry of life but gets recharged by the continuing metabolism of food